Chapters twenty through twenty three of Out of the Shadow by Rose Gollop Cohen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty. Father made the life for me as easy as he could, but there were many hardships he could not prevent. We began the day at six in the morning. I would stand dressing with my eyes closed and feel about for my buttons. But once I was out on the street and felt the moist early morning air, I was wide awake at once when we had been in the shop about an hour a grey-bearded little old man used to come in lugging a big basket of food covered with black oilcloth he was the shop peddler he always stopped near the door rested his basket against it and groaned oh the stairs the stairs in america the men looked at him with pity and atta at the sight of him would sometimes begin to sing the song of the peddler if the boss was not in the shop or the men were not very busy one of them would take the basket from the peddler and place it on a chair in the middle of the room then each shop hand picked out a roll and the little old man poured him out a tiny glass of brandy for two cents father used to buy me an apple and a sweetened roll we ate while we worked i used to think two cents a good deal to spend for my breakfast but often i was almost sick with hunger at noon we had our big meal then father would send me out for half a pound of steak or a slice of beef liver and a pint of beer which he sometimes bought in partnership with two or three other men he used to broil the steak in the open coal fireplace where the presser heated his irons and cut it into tiny squares he always picked out the juiciest bits and pushed them to my side of the plate and while there was still quite some meat he would lay down his fork and push his chair away from the table with an air as if he had had more than enough he also got me to drink beer before long i could drink a full glass but i did not like it one day it made me quite sick after that i refused to drink it i liked my work and learned it easily and father was pleased with me as soon as i knew how to baste pocket flaps he began to teach me how to baste the coat edges this was hard work the double ply of overcoat cloth stitched in with canvas and tape made a very stiff edge my fingers often stiffened with pain as i rolled and basted the edges sometimes a needle or two would break before i could do one coat then father would offer to finish the edge for me but if he gave me my choice i never let him at these moments i wanted so to master the thing myself that i felt my whole body trembling with the desire and with my habit of personifying things i used to bend over the coat on my lap force the obstinate and squeaking needle wet with perspiration in and out of the cloth and whisper with determination no you shall not get the best of me when i succeeded i was so happy that father who often watched me with a smile would say raoul your face is shining now rest a while he always told me to rest after i did well i loved these moments i would push my stool closer to the wall near which i sat lean my back against it and look about the shop sitting so i could see atta and all the six men at work the baster sat turk-like on his table he was small and slight his skin was almost as dark as a negro's and his features resembled a bulldog's but his was an unusually bright face his black eyes flashed with intelligence and when he laughed showing his white even teeth i liked to look at him sometimes he would raise his eyes suddenly from his work assume an earnest expression open his eyes wide and look at me intently then i would know that i had been staring the boss moved about heavily at his big table i could not help looking at him when he spoke or laughed his nostrils were always dilated and whitened he often came over to our table to borrow atta's wax or small scissors almost every time he came he tried to pinch her cheek or take hold of her hand she always dodged threatened him with the point of her needle and said half seriously half jestingly keep your hands off please this was the first sentence i learned in english the man in the shop who interested me most was the presser he was almost black and he had a small black beard his features were regular and good but there was no life in his face and his voice had a tired ring in it his back was enormous his chest narrow and he lifted his twenty-five pound iron with difficulty i often felt sad when i looked at him without knowing why and was glad when he sent me on an errand he was the jest in the shop he had been six years in this country and had not yet decided whether he should send for his wife or as he often said take a souvenir of america and go home to russia 
the men teased him about his wife and little girl who they said would be a woman by the time he decided i too often wondered will he go home and what will he take as a remembrance one day when i was not busy i went over and asked him if he wanted me to go on an errand he put down his iron on the flat stone which he used as a stand and looked at me thoughtfully no he said as i turned away he called me back raoul he said if you were my little girl in europe what would you like me to bring you from america i thought for a moment and said earrings when he came in the next morning he had a massive gold watch and chain a marriage ring and a small pair of earrings a week later there was another presser in the shop one with a straight back and a red beard chapter twenty one one day a jewelry peddler came into the shop he showed us a watch he told the men that the watch was of fourteen carat gold but he would sell it cheaply for fifteen dollars because it was second hand the assistant machine operator bought the watch for ten dollars he was living on very little in order to save and send for his family in russia but a good watch he figured is as good as cash lasts a lifetime the men all congratulated the operator and teased morris you shall have to treat to-night i certainly will he said heartily i'll treat the whole shop i learned to look forward to these little merry-makings and love them how they also shortened the day at noon morris the operator went down as usual to his dinner he returned in a few minutes looking so pale even his lips were white and when he began to talk his voice trembled he told the men that he had been to a pawn-shop and that he was told the watch was worth at most three dollars the men were shocked they held a short consultation and finally told morris that they would raffle the watch off each of them paid a dollar and a half morris himself won the watch that night we stopped work an hour earlier morris bought two pints of beer and some bologna and we feasted i liked the life in the shop yet there were times when i felt unhappy the men often told vulgar jokes the first time this happened father looked at me and groaned don't listen he said or pretend you don't hear but i could never keep my face from turning red one day when atta and i were alone at our table she said it is too bad that you have a tell-tale face you better learn to hide your feelings what you hear in this shop is nothing compared with what you will hear in other shops look at me but when i would look over at atta it seemed to me that her needle actually flew in and out of her sleeve lining and her pretty little mouth looked more pursed than usual chapter twenty two when i learned to find my way home alone my hours were not so long for father was a peace worker and as i was only helping him he could do as he pleased with my time and so now i came into the shop at seven o'clock in the morning and found my roll and apple already waiting for me and when i went home at seven o'clock in the evening it was still broad daylight our room was a dingy place where the sun never came in i always felt lonely and a little homesick on coming to it but i would soon shake off the feeling i would cook and eat some soup and then go and stand on the stoop and watch the children playing one night as i came out of our room into the hall i caught a few strains of music coming from the roof i went up and found under the sky blue and bright with the stars and the city lights twinkling all around a group of irish-american girls and boys waltzing to the music of a harmonica i sat down in the shadow near one of the chimneys and watched the stars and the dancing and listened to the song of my beautiful irish maid after this i went up every evening at first the girls and boys showed me that i was not welcome by making ugly grimaces at me but as i persisted for i wanted to know the americans they became used to seeing me and soon they paid no more attention to me than to the chimney near which i sat on friday i worked only the first half of the day then i would go home to do the washing and cleaning in our room all morning i would count the hours and half hours and my heart beat with joy at the thought that i would soon leave the shop when at last i heard the noon whistle from the big paper factory on water street i used to bend my head low to hide this joy i felt ashamed at my eagerness to leave off work when i came out into the street i had to stand still for a while and look about i felt dazed by the light and the air and the joy of knowing that i was free for at these moments i did not remember the work at home i would start to walk along slowly linger under the trees of which there was one here and there on cherry street and watch the children on the way home from school to lunch 
in their white summery dresses and with books under their arms they appeared to me like wonderful little beings of a world entirely different from mine i watched and envied them but i often consoled myself with the thought when our children come they too will go to school on the stoop i lingered too i watched the children playing jacks and from minute to minute i put off going in at last with a feeling of guilt i would realize that the afternoon was almost gone and my work not even begun but it was at such moments that i did my best and quickest work i would rush upstairs catch up the bundle of soiled clothes under my arm and run down into the cellar to the wash-tubs once the washing was done i did not feel so guilty and by the time i was at the floor which i scrubbed with great swishes of water i sang cheerfully after the ball is over on saturday father and i used to go to see aunt masha the first time we went and asked to see her her mistress opened a door in the back of the store and called in a shrill voice jenny jenny to my surprise it was aunt masha that came out chapter twenty three kate mrs felsberg's eldest daughter and i became friends she was seventeen tall flat-looking and stooping but her face was very pretty her blue-gray eyes twinkled with mischief and her manner was shy and bold at the same time she was also a great tease she teased me constantly because on a saturday the sabbath i would not light the gas nor carry my handkerchief in my hand on the street nor would i sit down to a meal at any time before washing my hands and saying grace you are like an old woman she used to say laughingly you are more fit for palestine where the aged are spending their last days than for america she also called me little village maiden i think this hurt most and so i kept away from her but there was one thing about kate to which i finally succumbed she had a beautiful voice and when she sang i forgave her everything and longed to go to her and finally i did and now of an evening i stayed in my room and listened to kate singing and talking about boys besides the door which led into the hall of the tenement and the one that opened into the felsberg flat there was still another door in our room against this our cot stood there were two rooms on the other side in which lived a plump wrinkled little old woman who wore a bit of red worsted around her wrist to keep off the evil eye with her lived her son who was single because he would not marry a worn-out shop-girl and a boarder kate talked constantly about the boarder and often half in fun half in earnest threw kisses at the door she told me that he was a machine operator but he looked like a student it was while sitting on the cot with her eyes on this door that she sang her best her sweet clear voice filled our dull room escaped through the window and filled the gray yard people always stood at the window in the house opposite when kate sang and from the other side of the door came little bursts of applause one night after kate had sung one of her russian songs we heard a body press against the door and a boyish voice call through the keyhole more sing more kate became almost hysterical with ecstasy she gave me a pinch a nudge and a slap which she had a habit of doing when she was gay and excited and bending down to the keyhole she said supposing you sing now not after hearing you he said but i would like to see you sing as well as here may i come in kate lifted her flushed face told me what he said and giggled he wants to come in i was curious to see the boy and watch the two meet but i did not want him to come in because father would be home soon and would want his supper but as i did not know how to refuse i said let him come kate barely had time to settle herself on the cot and control her giggles and i to place the chair for him at the little table when there was a knock at the door i opened it and saw a boy about eighteen with pale thin cheeks and bright dark eyes he stood expectant and smiling but his face sobered and he seemed surprised when he saw me i opened the door wide and when he saw kate's pink shimmering face his own brightened again he sat down on the chair and we two girls sat on the cot neither of them spoke for a few minutes and kate did not know where to look finally he began in english of course i did not understand what they were saying they paid no attention to me and soon i forgot them too though it was about them that i thought i saw kate and the boy engaged and married they were living in a beautiful house on grand street where you had to ring a bell to go in a little one toddled about in their rooms and they were happy one day suddenly i felt kate shaking me and saying ruth ruth what shall we do i hear your father's steps in the hall i stood up a little dazed 
i saw her run and lock the door then bidding the boy a quick farewell she hurried into her own rooms and closed the door behind her in the meantime father was at this door turning the knob finding it locked he knocked gently without clearly knowing why i suddenly felt dreadfully embarrassed and irritated that kate locked the door i went and unlocked it and father came in he saw the visitor at once and stood looking at him first with surprise then with astonishment and finally with anger he went over to the table put down the loaf of bread which he always brought when he came and opening the door wide he pointed and said angrily in russian bon. when the boy went out and the door was closed father turned to me his face looked so angry that i trembled this is very pretty conduct he said and you are not yet thirteen i began to cry and explain at once but father never listened to explanations and commanded me to be silent at the very first word the next day i told kate what father said and how he felt about me thinking that she would go and explain to him but she just laughed i felt deeply hurt and disappointed and i could not forget the boy's face as he left our room and now a different life began for me father thinking that he had given me too much freedom and had spoiled me went to the other extreme he began to treat me so severely that i could scarcely lift my head he suspected me at every step and found fault and blamed me for everything that happened one saturday while standing out on the stoop i saw one little girl show a cent to another and boasting that she was going to buy candy seeing money handled on sabbath had long lost its horror for me it occurred to me that i too would like to have a cent with which to do just as i pleased i went up at once to our room and asked father as he lay resting on the cot he looked at me silently for a long moment then he rose slowly took out his pocket-book took a cent from it held it out to me and said with a frown that reminded me of aunt masha here and see that this never happens again i felt as if the coin were burning my fingers i handed it back quickly left the room and walked about in the streets i felt mortally hurt i felt that i was working from morning till night like a grown-up person and yet when i wanted one single cent when evening came i went home cooked the rice and milk as usual put it on the table and then sat down away from it at the farthest end of the cot father ate a few spoonfuls and then commanded sit down at the table and eat your supper i am not hungry i answered and indeed i was not i could never eat when i was miserable the food always seemed to stick in my throat father commanded eat whether you want to or not eat because i say so again i repeated that i was not hungry he looked at me and said oh you are sulking very well we shall see without haste he laid down his spoon took down our coarse linen roller towel which i brought from home twisted it carefully into a rope and came over to me poor father i know now that he hated to hurt me and took long to prepare to give me time to change my mind will you eat he asked i coughed to steady my voice and said no he struck me across the back my only thought now was not to cry out on the right is the little old woman and her family on the left the felsbergs they will hear me i'll never be able to raise my head before any of them again and i prayed for strength father never did anything by halves i felt the towel across my back again and again finally he threw it down and said panting for breath girl i'll break you if you don't change and i said in my heart my father we shall see he turned out the gas went out slamming the door after him so that the windows rattled when it was all quiet a door opened in our room and mrs felsberg came in with a light and a bottle of vaseline End of chapter 23chapters twenty four through twenty seven of out of the shadow by rose gollop cohen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty four now i felt lonely still oftener for i missed father's confidence and tenderness and kate's friendship and to this unhappiness more was soon added father and i were on our block one day walking toward home when a boy in uniform coming toward us walked into me with so much force that i stumbled backward a few steps and for a minute could not catch my breath father looked at me and began to scold as usual now how often have i told you to keep to the right there is no room for dreamers here 
it had seemed to me that the boy struck against me intentionally but i was not sure the next day it happened again and now my peace was gone the boy lived in the same building and as often as i met him he hurt me he never passed me without shoving his elbow into my side or giving my braid a tug so that it felt as if the skin on my forehead would burst he was as tall as i was and as my hair reached below my waist he could do this by a slight movement of the hand while his arm hung innocently at his side he always did it so quickly that i could never catch him at it and i don't believe any one else ever saw him do it but his favourite way of hurting was to assume an absent-minded expression when he saw me coming look about and walk into me striking my chest with his elbow this lasted for weeks and my life became a nightmare to me i began to be afraid to be out on the street i never left the building without looking up and down the block first now that father treated me so harshly i did not like to talk to him about it thinking that he would lay the blame on me and as for striking the boy it did not even occur to me to do so he was a messenger boy but i did not know it and even if i had it would not have made any difference for i as my grandfather looked upon uniforms with fear and respect and besides too he was a gentile and this country was his one saturday morning i rose earlier than usual i felt happier than i had been for a long time i had won my father's favour the day before by doing a particularly hard piece of work he was so pleased that he showed it to the boss and smiled at me in the old way at noon when i left to go and do the work at home he came out with me took me to a shoe store and bought me shoes and so this morning early as soon as father went to synagogue i too rose and tidied the room then i combed out my hair carefully and let it loose i put on my brown clean calico and my new shoes these were my first american shoes and though they were much too large and my feet looked rather clumsy in them father believed that clothes for children should be large enough to grow in still they were new and the buttons and patent leather tips shone and so i was pleased as soon as i was quite ready i went out to stand on the stoop i scarcely ever went walking now as i was in constant fear of meeting the messenger boy i had not been on the stoop long when i saw him coming from the clinton street side my heart began to beat so that it pained and all my happiness was gone in a moment but immediately i comforted myself with the thought that i was on the far end of the stoop and that he could not possibly hurt me when i stood there because the stoop was so wide and he would have to walk up the end he reached first i pressed close to the iron railing at my end and watched him coming he walked with a swagger this morning when he came nearer i saw a new cap in place of the old one in which i had always seen him the little brass button on each side of the peak sparkled as he moved his head suddenly he saw me immediately he slackened his pace assumed his absent-minded expression and began looking about my heart beat more violently what should i do run upstairs i felt sure he would find a way to hurt me but i always hated to run away i stood still almost holding my breath as he came nearer and nearer as he walked along slowly he kept looking dreamily across the street and passed beyond our even end of the stoop a step or two then as if he suddenly realized it he stopped looked about and came back and now he must pass close to me the next moment i felt my toes crushed under his heel i caught hold of the iron railing and closed my eyes for a moment then i looked down at my new shoes one tip was broken and my toes inside felt moist i looked at the boy for he had stopped right opposite me he was so sure of me and stood gazing far away and whistling softly all at once a feeling of hatred came into my heart my temples began to throb and now i did not see his uniform nor did i remember as i often told myself that this country of america was his with one step i reached him snatched off his cap and ran and threw it into the gutter and began to stamp on it i broke the brim i crushed the little brass buttons under my heels i stamped it into the dirt and in a moment it did not look like a cap but i was not yet satisfied a few feet away i saw a little puddle of water i kicked the cap into it and began stamping on it all over again at last my strength began to give out and i became aware that a number of people had gathered and that the boy stood among them gaping at me i stopped stamping tossed back my hair which had fallen all about my face and passed close to him i thought if he touches me i'll strike him down but he did not 
the people who stood about were staring at me and talking when i came upstairs and looked at myself in the glass i thought they must have been saying the fury or the wild thing my hair was all tangled and seemed to stand up my face was dripping wet and covered with pink and white blotches and my eyes looked wild i locked the door and sat all morning laughing and crying hysterically and listening for a policeman's heavy footsteps in the hall i felt sure that a policeman would come and drag me to prison but when the day passed and nothing happened i became bolder and in the evening when i knew the boy would be coming out of the building i went out on the street i was curious now as to what would happen next the boy came out saw me and passed me quickly and at a good distance away i laughed quietly to myself and began to walk toward montgomery street where i saw the light of a street lamp shining on a tree chapter twenty five one evening in the fall father came home with two brightly coloured frameless pictures and nailed one on the door leading into the felsberg's rooms and the other on the door leading into the little old woman's he explained to me that the pictures were of the two men nominated for the presidential office the prospective presidents in these pictures were herdsmen each one dressed in fine black clothes and a high silk hat stood in the midst of a herd of cattle in one picture the herdsman was short stout and clean-shaven the cattle were round and sleek and the pasture green and abundant in the other it was just the reverse the herdsman was tall thin and bearded the cattle had fallen in sides and the ground was brown and bare i looked at the pictures and took them literally and seriously one meant four years of plenty the other four years of famine but after a while noticing that no one else seemed at all worried over it i merely wondered what happens on election day soon after this i saw the gentile boys on our block begin to store away into a cellar all the barrels boxes broken couches torn mattresses and every stick of wood they could lay hands on i understood that the preparations were for election night and i looked on silently with pleasant excitement at last election day came in the shop the men were discussing the candidates and there was a cheerful holiday atmosphere i bet you a pint of beer harrison will be elected i bet you two pints it will be cleveland in the afternoon i heard the men say they would go home early when i was leaving father too said he would be home before dark after supper i climbed out on mrs feldberg's fire escape and looked down between the bars into the street i saw the jewish men hurrying home from work and noticed that very few of the jewish children were out the gentile boys were busy dragging forth the barrels and couches and mattresses and piling them up in a heap in front of the four big tenements inhabited chiefly by jews when it grew dark they lit the heaps of rubbish and in a moment there was a great blaze the sparks flew the fire crackled and the reflections of the flames danced merrily on the small red brick houses opposite where the gentiles lived from the windows of these houses groups of people were leaning out talking and laughing merrily mrs felsberg also stuck her head out of the window for a moment looked down at the flame and said earnestly thank god there is no wind and if it comes i hope it will blow the other way i was beginning to feel uneasy and wished that father had come home before dark as he said he would scarcely any one passed through the block now i noticed with fear that not a jew was to be seen on the street after a little while i saw someone coming from the montgomery street side though i expected father to come through clinton street it occurred to me that perhaps he had decided this way was safer and i strained my eyes and watched when the person came nearer i saw that it was the son of the little old woman he walked slowly hesitatingly and kept to the wall the men and the boys around the fire seemed to pay no attention to his coming but as soon as he was in front of the fire they suddenly attacked him there was a short tussle and soon i saw him rushed into the hall i was beside myself with fear now why doesn't father come why did i leave him i could not help blaming myself again mrs felsberg came over and looked out of the window and asked isn't your father here yet raoul no i shook my head i could not answer her i pressed my forehead to the iron bars and looked over to clinton street every time the fire was poked the whole block was lit up and i could see all the way over to the corner i thought i saw a figure lurking away over in the shadow could that be father i thought perhaps it is some other jewish man oh god will he ever come 
at last i saw him turn from clinton into cherry street the blaze flared suddenly and i recognized his tan suit and hat i jumped up leaned over the fire escape and watched him coming nearer and nearer keeping in the middle of the sidewalk the boys and men stood about the fire laughing talking pushing each other one was playing on a harmonica and a few were waltzing at last i saw father almost opposite the blaze my heart stood still and my eyes felt stretched so far apart that it seemed as though i could never close them again will they let him pass oh that is too good to be true and indeed it was the next moment i saw a black mass of bodies hurl itself at him father i screamed down my voice struck terror into my own heart the next moment i was rushing blindly through mrs felberg's rooms lit only by the blaze from the outside knocking myself against table and chairs at last i was out in the hall and went falling and tumbling downstairs on the first floor i met him coming up pale and hatless we stopped and looked at each other i was beside myself with joy to see him alive but i heard myself say father your hat and he smiled and said pantingly that is nothing i needed a new one chapter twenty six i had seen from the first that jews were treated roughly on cherry street i had seen the men and boys that stood about the saloons at every corner make ugly grimaces at the passing jews and throw after them stones and shoes pulled out of the ash-cans i had often seen these loafers as we called them attack a jewish peddler dump his pushcart of apples into the gutter fill their pockets and walk away laughing and eating i had run for the apples in the gutter rolling in every direction and helped to pick them up i myself had often walked two blocks out of my way to reach home through montgomery street instead of going through clinton street where there were three saloons and yet as soon as i was safe in the house i scarcely gave the matter a second thought perhaps it was because to see a jew maltreated was nothing new for me here where there were so many new and strange things for me to see and understand this was the one familiar thing i had grown used to seeing strange jews mistreated whenever they happened to come to our village in russia but after election night i felt differently i was haunted by the picture of the little old woman's son struggling with the young irish americans near the bonfire and of my father coming up the stairs pale and hatless i was never easy in my mind now except when i was with father i always sat up at night until he came home and if he happened to be a few minutes late i was beside myself with fear i pictured him murdered and burned alive i listened to every tale about cherry and water streets i heard that a policeman had been found in the dark hallway with his head stuck into a barrel smothered to death and for a time i could think about nothing else one friday afternoon soon after election i finished my washing and cleaning early and i went out into the street i was returning about five o'clock through clinton street when i saw a jewish peddler with a pushcart standing on the corner of monroe street and looking about helplessly i saw him watching me as i came up when i was near he asked are you jewish i nodded my head and stopped i saw that his pushcart held fish mixed with chunks of ice you can do me a favor he said in a pleading tone you see this handful of fish this is all my profit if i could get over to that group of jewish houses on cherry street he pointed to our tenements i could still sell it though it is late but i dare not pass those loafers hanging round the saloons but what can i do i asked you can do much he said with a smile they have great respect for a lady in america but i began that is all right he said with a wave of the hand you look like a lady and if you will just walk beside me while i am passing the loafers they won't touch me i remembered now often having seen jewish men escorted past dangerous places and the women would as often be irish i stepped into the gutter and for greater safety laid my hand on the pushcart and walked along beside him when we were passing the saloon the loafers made grimaces and shouted after him but did not touch him we stopped at our group of houses he thanked me and at once became businesslike he shook up the ice in the pushcart and then placing his hand at one corner of his mouth american fashion and looking up at the windows he shouted lustily hurry hurry women fresh pike here fresh pike for the sabbath 
i found that father was already at home as i came into the room i saw him sitting at the table before the little mirror resting against the wall clipping his beard i was so surprised and shocked to see him actually do this thing that i could neither speak nor move for some minutes and i knew that he too felt embarrassed after the first glance i kept my eyes steadily on the floor in front of me and began to talk to him quietly but with great earnestness you had been so pious at home father i said more pious than any one else in our whole neighbourhood and now you are cutting your beard grandmother would never have believed it how she would weep the snipping of the scissors still went on but i knew by the sound that now he was only making a pretence at cutting at last he laid it down and said in a tone that was bitter yet quiet they do not like jews on cherry street and one with a long beard has to take his life into his own hands but father i said looking at him now must we live on cherry street yes we must he said turning to me quickly and speaking in a more passionate tone they want the jews to come and settle here and because it is so hard to live here they have lowered the rents i save here at least two dollars a month you don't understand for mother's journey we need not only tickets and money for other expenses but we also need money for at least second-hand furniture this is not like home there the house was our own and for the lot and garden we paid one dollar a year there too we were among friends and relatives while here if we haven't rent for one month we are thrown out on the street do you understand i said i understood chapter twenty seven father began to strain all his energy to save the money to send for mother and the children in the shop one morning i realized that he had been leaving out of his breakfast the tiny glass of brandy for two cents and was eating just the roll so i too made my sacrifice when as usual he gave me the apple and the roll i took the roll but refused the apple and he did not urge me when a cold grey day at the end of november found him in his light tan suit quite worn and me in my thin calico frock now washed out to a tan colour we went to a second-hand clothing store on division street and he bought me a fuzzy brown coat reaching a little below my waist for fifty cents and for himself a thin threadbare overcoat and now we were ready for the winter about the same time that the bitter cold came father told me one night that he had found work for me in a shop where he knew the presser i lay awake long that night i was eager to begin life on my own responsibility but was also afraid we rose earlier than usual that morning for father had to take me to the shop and not be over late for his own work i wrapped my thimble in scissors with a piece of bread for breakfast in a bit of newspaper carefully stuck two needles into the lapel of my coat and we started the shop was on pelham street a shop district one block long and just wide enough for two ordinary sized wagons to pass each other we stopped at a door where i noticed at once a brown shining porcelain knob and a half rubbed off number seven father looked at his watch and at me don't look so frightened he said you need not go in until seven perhaps if you start in at this hour he will think you have been in the habit of beginning at seven and will not expect you to come in earlier remember be independent at seven o'clock rise and go home no matter whether the others go or stay he began to tell me something else but broke off suddenly said good-bye over his shoulder and went away quickly i watched him until he turned into monroe street now only i felt frightened and waiting made me nervous so i tried the knob the door yielded heavily and closed slowly i was half-way up when it closed entirely leaving me in darkness i groped my way to the top of the stairs and hearing a clattering noise of machines i felt about found a door and pushed it open and went in a tall dark beardless man stood folding coats at a table i went over and asked him for the name i don't remember what it was yes he said crossly what do you want i said i am the new feller hand he looked at me from head to foot my face felt so burning hot that i could scarcely see it is more likely he said that you can pull bastings and fell sieve lining then turning from me he shouted over the noise of the machine presser is this the girl the presser put down the iron and looked at me i suppose so he said i only know the father the cross man looked at me again and said let's see what you can do he kicked a chair from which the back had been broken off to the finisher's table threw a coat upon it and said raising the corner of his mouth 
make room for the new feller hand one girl tittered two men glanced at me over their shoulders and pushed their chairs apart a little by this time i scarcely knew what i was about i laid my coat down somewhere and pushed my bread into the sleeve then i stumbled into the bit of space made for me at the table drew in the chair and sat down the men were so close to me on each side i felt the heat of their bodies and could not prevent myself from shrinking away the men noticed and probably felt hurt one made a joke the other laughed and the girls bent their heads low over their work all at once the thought came if i don't do this coat quickly and well he will send me away at once i picked up the coat threaded my needle and began hastily repeating the lesson father impressed upon me be careful not to twist the sleeve lining take small false stitches my hands trembled so that i could not hold the needle properly it took me a long while to do the coat but at last it was done i took it over to the boss and stood at the table waiting while he was examining it he took long trying every stitch with his needle finally he put it down and without looking at me gave me two other coats i felt very happy when i sat down at the table i drew my knees close together and stitched as quickly as i could when the peddler came into the shop everybody bought rolls i felt hungry but i was ashamed and would not eat the plain heavy rye bread while the others ate rolls all day i took my finished work and laid it on the boss's table he would glance at the clock and give me other work before the day was over i knew that this was a piece workshop that there were four machines and sixteen people were working i also knew that i had done almost as much work as the grown-up girls and that they did not like me i heard betsy the head feller hand talking about a snip of a girl coming and taking the very bread out of your mouth the only one who could have been my friend was the presser who knew my father but him i did not like the worst i knew about him just now was that he was a soldier because the men called him so but a soldier i had learned was capable of anything and so noticing that he looked at me often i studiously kept my eyes from his corner of the room seven o'clock came and every one worked on i wanted to rise as father had told me to do and go home but i had not the courage to stand up alone i kept putting off going from minute to minute my neck felt stiff and my back ached i wished there were a back to my chair so that i could rest against it a little when the people began to go home it seemed to me that it had been night a long time End of chapter twenty seven Chapters twenty eight through thirty of Out of the Shadow by Rose Gollop Cohen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty eight. The next morning, when I came into the shop at seven o'clock, I saw at once that all the people were there working as steadily as if they had been at work a long while. I had just time to put away my coat and go over to the table when the boss shouted gruffly, Look here, girl, if you want to work here, you better come in early. No office hours in my shop it seemed very still in the room even the machine stopped and his voice sounded dreadfully distinct i hastened into the bit of space between the two men and sat down he brought me two coats and snapped hurry with these from this hour a hard life began for me he refused to employ me except by the week he paid me three dollars and for this he hurried me from early until late he gave me only two coats at a time to do when i took them over and as he handed me the new work he would say quickly and sharply hurry and when he did not say it in words he looked at me and i seemed to hear even more plainly hurry i hurried but he was never satisfied by looks and manner he made me feel that i was not doing enough late at night when the people would stand up and begin to fold their work away and i too would rise feeling stiff in every limb and thinking with dread of our cold empty little room and the uncooked rice he would come over with still another coat i need it the first thing in the morning he would give as an excuse i understood that he was taking advantage of me because i was a child and now that it was dark in the shop except for the low single gas jet over my table and the one over his at the other end of the room and there was no one to see more tears fell on the sleeve lining as i bent over it than there were stitches in it i did not soon complain to father i had given him an idea of the people and the work during the first days but when i had been in the shop a few weeks i told him the boss is hurrying the life out of me 
i know now that if i had put it less strongly he would have paid more attention to it father hated to hear things put strongly besides he himself worked very hard he never came home before eleven and he left at five in the morning he said to me now work a little longer until you have more experience then you can be independent but if i did piece work father i would not have to hurry so and i could go home earlier when the other people go father explained further it pays him better to employ you by the week don't you see if you did piecework he would have to pay you as much as he pays a woman piece-worker but this way he gets almost as much work out of you for half the amount a woman is paid i myself did not want to leave the shop for fear of losing a day or even more perhaps in finding other work to lose half a dollar meant that it would take so much longer before mother and the children would come and now i wanted them more than ever before i longed for my mother and a home where it would be light and warm and she would be waiting when we came from work because i longed for them so i lived much in imagination for so i could have them near me often as the hour for going home drew near i would sit stitching and making believe that mother and the children were home waiting on leaving the shop i would hasten along through the street keeping my eyes on the ground so as to shut out everything but what i wanted to see i pictured myself walking into the house there was a delicious warm smell of cooked food mother greeted me near the door and the children gathered about me shouting and trying to pull me down mother scolded them saying let her take her coat off see how cold her hands are but they paid no attention and pulled me down to them their little arms were about my neck their warm faces against my cold cheeks and we went tumbling all over each other soon mother called supper is ready there was a scampering and a rush to the table followed by a scraping of chairs and clattering of dishes finally we were all seated there was browned meat and potatoes for supper i used to keep this up until i turned the key in the door and opened it and stood facing the dark cold silent room chapter twenty nine in proportion as life in the shop became harder it also became harder at home i had to do the washing and cleaning at night now one night a week i cleaned and one i washed i used to hang my dress on a string over mrs felberg's stove to dry overnight in the morning i pulled it straight and put it right on the rest of the night i slept during these days i could not seem to get enough sleep sometimes when i remembered how a few months before mother had to chase me to bed with cries and with scoldings it hardly seemed true that time seemed so far away so vague like a dream now on coming into the room i would light the lamp and the kerosene oil stove and put on the soup to cook then i would sit down with my knees close to the soap box on which the stove stood to keep myself warm but before long my body relaxed my head grew heavy with the odour of the burning oil and i longed to lie down i knew that it was bad to go to sleep without supper two or three times father woke me but it was no use i could not eat then and so i tried hard to keep awake but finally i could not resist it the cot was so near just a step away i could touch it with my hand i would rise a little from the chair and all bent over as i was i would tumble right in and roll myself in the red comforter clothes and all it was on these nights that i began to forget to pray but it was only during the first part of the night that i slept heavily after that i was half asleep half awake i was in constant fear of being late to work often in the middle of the night i would wake up with a start tumble out of bed scarcely conscious of what i was about and run to the clock which we put on the table for the night there i stood peering at it unseeingly for a long while gradually i would realize where i was what i was about and that i must see the time and only now i could see the hands of the clock distinctly both on the twelve perhaps how happy i felt when it was still so early with what a feeling of joy and relief i lay back on the pillow and closed my eyes but if i happened to wake near five i would not close them again for fear of oversleeping that was about the time that father left one morning when i started up into a half sitting position i saw at once that the light in the lamp was turned up a little and on the table lay the larger part of the loaf of bread and so i knew that father had gone i peered at the clock and it seemed to me that it was a quarter to seven very late with my eyes half shut i slid out of bed hastily and began to dress seeing all the while the boss's eyes glaring at me threateningly 
it did not take me long to put on my frock and the coat i always put on as soon as i had the dress on because it was so bitter cold in the room i buttoned every other button on my shoes and just smoothed my hair back leaving the tangles for saturday i broke off a hunk of bread snatched a piece of newspaper and blew out the light as i felt my way to the door and through the dark hall it struck me how quiet it was at the felsbergs and the little old woman's and all through the house at other times when i started the whole building was full of life now as i was passing i just heard a door open and close softly and a slight noiseless movement here and there in my hurry i did not stop to think about it but hastened on i drew the street door open the next moment a fierce gust of wind tore it from my hand and closed it with a bang i had seen that a heavy snow had fallen overnight i stood for a moment shivering with cold and fear then i wound my braid around my neck under the collar and pulling the hair over my ears a little i drew the door open again and stepped out quickly there were no steps it all looked flat and white the wind moaned and whistled and here and there a huddled dark form hurried along over the white i tucked my bread under my arm slipped muffwise each bare hand into the opposite sleeve and started to run i seemed to be running very fast and yet i saw that i was making little headway the wind was fearful it struck against my chest constantly at one moment it wound my calico skirt about my knees and i could not take a step the next it blew it way up in the air and i had to put it down with my hands i stopped and took some minutes to unbutton my coat with my stiffened fingers and to fold the fronts tightly over each other on my chest the cold lay on it like an iron weight and i could not breathe then i bent my head before the wind and ran on soon i was exhausted where am i i wondered i stopped and looked about it looked so unfamiliar with all the white underfoot and the rows of houses on each side of me standing so still they looked like stone walls it is like a prison i thought suddenly it seemed to me that i was in prison and the dark forms were pursuing me and i ran in terror i turned this way and that way not knowing nor heeding now where i was going my skirt flapped and the wind blew the snow into my face blinding me as i ran i tried to run clear of the walls but i saw that they were on each side of me enclosing me whichever way i turned i finally came into a space where i felt the walls rose higher than ever and the space between grew narrow there was something familiar to me in that though i dared not look about i ran to a door stopped and clung to it and pressed my face against it my eyes closed my numb fingers groped until they found and closed over something which they recognized at once instinctively i had run to the shop and now i stood before the door holding on to the brown porcelain knob i was never so happy before to see the shop door i leaned against the door and looked at the dark windows of the shops opposite and realized gradually that i had left home too early the shop must be closed i thought i must wait here until it opens i pressed into the corner of the door the wind kept flapping and fluttering my dress and sweeping the snow back and forth before me soon i felt my knees bending of their own accord and so i sat down i saw my bread slip from under my arm it made me feel a little uneasy to see it lying there on the snow and so i watched it for a moment i put out my hand to tuck my dress about me and i felt my head lean back against the door i was beginning to feel very comfortable i seemed to be sitting on something soft and i no longer felt the cold the wind was growing quieter and quieter and the street lights shone so faintly i felt a slight pressure on my arm then it became heavier and soon i felt myself being shaken quite roughly and a familiar voice saying for god's sake girl what are you doing here it was the presser from our shop he helped me up and asked me again what i was doing there i wanted to explain but could not move my tongue so i just looked at him come quickly into the shop he said he caught hold of my arm pushed the door open and pulled me along with him even now i remembered that he was a soldier and tried to draw back but i doubt whether he even felt my resistance he drew me along into the hall and up the dark narrow stairs he unlocked the door propped me up against a wall and said now stand here until i light the gas when there was a light he put me on a chair near the fireplace covered me up with coats and then began hurriedly to shovel the ashes out of the grate into a pail i kept my teeth closed tightly and sat watching his every movement he soon had a crackling fire 
he lifted my chair close to it and made me hold my hands out i saw him empty one little bundle of wood after another into the grate i won't put any coal on until you are quite warm he said it would take too long to burn up then he mumbled to himself when he sees how much wood i use this morning he will hang himself and i'll never hear the end of it when my tongue had thawed a little i told him how i happened to be out so early then he asked me whether i had anything to eat i remembered that i had dropped my bread near the door on the snow and told him so he went out and found it good he said you have bread and i have some slices of smoked salmon he took it out of his overcoat pocket wrapped it in paper drew a chair close to the fire sat down and held it out to me i said i don't care for any he looked offended if you won't accept anything he said it means that you would not give anything of yours either to show him that it was not so i began at once to break my bread in half but my fingers were still too numb so i gave it to him good he said again you will take half of my salmon and i'll take half of your bread he cut the bread with his penknife which he never for a moment let go out of his hand it is from home meaning from russia he said flashing the blades before me while we sat eating and holding our hands to the fire he told me about himself he said that he had escaped from the russian army a year before and that his wife and two-year-old little girl were still in russia he was trying to save and send for them as i watched his face while he was talking i wondered that i ever disliked him i thought now that he had a very kind face and if it were not for his long moustache which he often twirled he would have been good-looking i also told him about father and myself and mother and the children in russia i told him that we hoped to send for them in the spring that is why i am working so hard i said looking at him earnestly he looked at me too and his eyes seemed to be laughing at me but he said seriously yes you have to sweat for your slice of bread he rose and stood for a moment looking at the door and listening there he comes the vampire he said i hear his footsteps in the hall chapter thirty that morning i could not get warm in the shop the boss gave me three coats to do instead of two by mistake i thought i spread two on my lap and the third i hugged close to my chest as i worked on it i should have also liked to keep my own coat on but i was afraid that if he knew how cold i was he would think i could not do as much work and would send me home and make me lose half a day's pay chills were running up and down my back and i could scarcely bend my fingers to hold the needle and i pricked my thumb my fingers were so numb that i did not feel it indeed i did not know it until i saw a tiny red stain on the white sleeve lining i looked and looked at it and could not at once believe my eyes and my heart pounded with fear i wondered shall i take it to the boss at once he will make me pay for it how much is a sleeve lining fifty cents perhaps even a dollar i determined not to show it to him at once i finished it folded it and laid it on the floor under my chair when i finished the other two coats i took them over to the boss i felt sick at the very thought that he might ask me for the third one but he did not he looked at me crossly and wanted to know whether i was sleeping over my work all morning i sat thinking about the blood-stain and wondering what the price of a sleeve lining was finally i could not stand it i had to know i bent over the table toward betsy and asked how much a sleeve lining is why she wanted to know i am just wondering i said she looked at me sharply have you damaged one she asked my face began to burn i bent my head low over my work and did not answer for the noon meal all went out except the presser and betsy i pulled the coat out from under my chair and looked at it i was so miserable that i could not help crying betsy looked at me in surprise and the presser came over i showed them the stain the presser thought he could take it out with benzine he took it over to his table and there he rubbed and rubbed it with a tiny cloth and held it away from him and looked at it from all sides finally he became impatient an unusual thing a stain on a coat he said and flung it into the pile on the boss's table End of chapter thirty chapters thirty one and thirty two of out of the shadow by rose gollop cohen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty one 
one day i noticed that there was a good deal of whispering among the men in the shop at noon when all went out to lunch and i ran out to get a slice of cheese for mine i saw that the men had gathered on the street before the door they were eating sandwiches stamping about over the snow and disputing in anxious earnest whispers in the shop the boss looked gloomier than ever i'll not have any one coming into my shop and telling me what to do he shouted to a strange man who came over to his table to talk to him this shop is mine the machines are mine if they are willing to work on my conditions well and good if not let them go to the devil all the tailors are not dead yet at our table betsy whispered the men joined the union the boss is in a hurry for the work there was a twinkle in betsy's usually lifeless eyes i had no idea what a union meant or what all this trouble was about but i learned a little the next day when i came in a little after six in the morning i found only the three girls who were at my table not a man except the boss was in the shop the men came in about five minutes to seven and then stood or sat at the presser's table talking and joking quietly the boss stood at his table brushing coats furiously every minute or so he glanced at the clock and his face looked black with anger at the first stroke of seven the presser blew a whistle and every man went to his place at the minute of twelve the presser again blew the whistle and the men went out to their noon meal those who remained in the shop ate without hurry and read their newspapers the boss kept his eye on us girls we began last ate hurriedly and sat down to work at once betsy looked at the men reading their newspapers and grumbled in a whisper this is what it means to belong to a union you get time to straighten out your bones i knew that betsy had been a feller hand for many years her back was quite bent over and her hands were white and flabby the men returned a little before one and sat waiting for the stroke of the clock and the presser's whistle at seven in the evening when the presser blew his whistle the men rose almost with one movement put away their work and turned out the lights over their tables and machines we girls watched them go enviously and the boss turned his back towards the door he did not answer their good night in the dark and quiet that followed his great shears clipped loudly and angrily one saturday afternoon father came home and showed me a little book with a red paper cover which he took from his breast pocket this he said is my union book you too must join the union he told me he had heard that a few of the feller hands had organized and a mass meeting was to be held in the hall on clinton street that evening he took me to the door of the building at eight o'clock saw a young woman enter and told me to follow her as i had no idea what a meeting was like or what to expect i was dazed and dazzled by the great number of lights the red carpet covering the floor and the crowd of people already seated on benches along the walls the middle of the room was not used i glanced about from the doorway for a seat near by but the only ones i could see were in front and for this i finally aimed looking neither to right nor to left and feeling painfully conscious of my shabbiness the seat i was forced to take was right in front and only about two yards away from the small square platform i was so uneasy at being exposed from all sides that it was some time before i forgot my bare head my red hands with the cracked and bleeding skin and my shoes with their turned-up toes already worn out and still too large for me by that time a young man was standing on the platform speaking i had seen this young man two or three times before he lived on cherry street a few doors away from us and kate felsberg had told me once that he was a student what he was saying now was something like this fourteen hours a day you sit on a chair often without a back felling coats fourteen hours you sit close to the other feller hand feeling the heat of her body against yours her breath on your face fourteen hours with your back bent your eyes close to your work you sit stitching in a dull room often by gaslight in the winter during all these hours as you sit stitching your body is numb with cold in the summer as far as you are concerned there might be no sun no green grass no soft breezes you with your eyes close to the coat on your lap are sitting and sweating the livelong day the black cloth dust eats into your very pores you are breathing the air that all the other bent and sweating bodies in the shop are throwing off and the air that comes in from the yard heavy and disgusting with filth and the odour of the open toilets if any of you know this and think about it you say to yourselves no doubt what is the use of making a fuss 
will the boss pay any attention to me if i should talk to him and anyway it won't be for long i won't stay in the shop all my life i'll perhaps this year or next girls i know your thought you expect to get married not so quick even the man who works in a shop himself does not want to marry a white-faced dull-eyed girl who for years has been working fourteen hours a day he realizes that you left your strength in the shop and that to marry you he would take on a bundle of troubles and doctor's bills on his head you know what he does most often he sends to russia for a girl he once knew one who has never seen the inside of a shop or else he marries the little servant girl with the red cheeks and bright eyes and even if you do marry are you secure don't forget that your husband himself is working in the shop fourteen hours and more a day breathing the filthy air and the cloth dust how long will he last who knows you may have to go back to the shop and even worse than this may be awaiting you your children may have to go to the shop and unless you now change it they may have to go back to the same dull shops the filthy air and the fourteen hours in the winter before daylight your little daughter may have to run through the streets in the rain and the snow in her worn little shoes and thin coat she will stand trembling before the boss in the same dull shop perhaps where you had once stood she will sit in the same backless chair rickety now with her little back bent for fourteen hours he seemed to be looking right at me i tucked my feet far under my seat and bent my head to hide my tears who is this man i wondered how does he know all this he continued each one of you alone can do nothing organize demand decent wages that you may be able to live in a way fit for human beings not for swine see that your shop has pure air and sun that your bodies may be healthy demand reasonable hours that you may have time to know your families to think to enjoy organize each one of you alone can do nothing together you can gain everything for a moment the room was perfectly still then there was a storm of applause and the people rose and began to press close to the platform i went to a vacant seat in an out-of-the-way corner and watched the people going out in groups and talking excitedly when the hall was almost empty i went over to the secretary's desk i want to join the union i said our feller hands had not been at the meeting but they too had joined the union and now our shop was a strictly union shop i'll always remember how proud i felt when the first evening at seven o'clock the presser blew the whistle and i with the other girls stood up with the men but not many girls joined the union and so it was soon broken up during these weeks i began to go to night school i went to the class right from the shop without supper for the doors of the school closed at half-past seven when i came into the class the lights the warmth to which i was not used and the girls reading in a slow monotonous tone one after another would soon put me to sleep before i dropped off the first night i learned one word sometimes it was the longest word on the page and stood out among the rest i left the shop soon after the union broke up i don't remember why or how it happened the boss of the next shop where father found work for me was kind the first morning when i came into work seeing the girls put me at the end of the table where it was dark he came over and made them let me sit near the window she is still a little girl he said she must grow and at night he told me that i need not stay after half-past seven he was kind to me in other ways too i had an unfortunate habit of losing needles it always seemed to me that i put my needle away quite carefully after i broke off the thread but when i needed it again i could seldom find it and as father never gave me more than one or two needles at a time i was often in great distress one day when i lost my needle and was looking about on the floor on the table and in my dress and feeling very miserable he came over and asked me very seriously what's wrong i felt that the time i was wasting was his and i mumbled guiltily i lost my needle without a word he went over to the men borrowed two needles at once and brought them to me after this whenever he saw me looking about for my needle he would take a whole packet out of his breast pocket and give me one or two and say laughingly here ruth is a needle and don't look so unhappy as he was not a tailor i knew that he kept the packet of needles to have them to give to me i felt happy in this shop 
the men sat at a separate table and i never heard an unkind or obscene word every night i had something to tell father about the boss's kindness father was glad that i was so fortunate and often told me try your best to keep this place and i did i worked as quickly and as well as i could one friday when the boss was paying his workers he said to me ruth i am short of money do you mind coming over to my home to-morrow morning at ten o'clock for yours i said i did not mind indeed i was glad i could do something for him though it was so little since i had been working in this shop and was not so hard driven and humiliated i blossomed out again my hair was always well combed out and on saturdays i wore it loose now too i was wearing new shoes and i had a new navy blue cashmere dress the first dress i had ever had that was not home-made and too large for me and it cost me a week's wages and many tears but it was worth it it was so pretty and gave me a great deal of joy with this dress even my yellowish-brown coat did not look so bad so dressed and feeling very cheerful i started out the next morning a little before ten i ran and skipped over the snow and clapped my hands together often to keep warm i found my boss in a room i thought gorgeous with its carpeted floor and upholstered chairs he was alone i saw and felt at once that there was not the calm and quietness about him to which i was accustomed he greeted me in the middle of the room touched my hair with his fingers and then went and sat down i remained standing you look very holiday-like he said i thought he too looked holiday-like he was wearing a new blue suit his brown hair lay smoother than ever and his dark reddish moustache was curled after a moment or so he said quite abruptly come ruth sit down here he motioned to his knee i felt my face flush i backed away towards the door and stood staring at him he too sat quite still looking at me then he rose and with his usual slowness and quietness put his hand into his pocket took out a roll of bills counted off three dollars and brought it over to me at the door tell your father he said to find you a new shop for to-morrow morning i walked home weeping bitterly i did not know what i should tell my father in my next shop there was only a single set the boss himself was the machine operator and of course there was the baster a finisher and a presser and i was the feller hand and at the end of the week the boss would leave his machine and run out to hester corner orchard street the tailor's hangout and bring a man for a couple of days to put the finishing touches on the coats before they went out to the warehouse shops of this kind were called one-horse wagons this boss was also single he was an ill-natured young man he was tall and so thin that he looked all dried up he did not trust any one any further than he could see instead of having his machine face the window like other operators he sat with his back to it and faced the room so that he could see every one of us me he kept at his machine making me use a corner of it as my table so that he could have me constantly under his eye he scolded and teased and swore from morning until night he told us every day in the week that we were not earning our money that we were botchers that we had nothing to worry us while his hair was turning grey that every year he was losing a hundred dollars while we risked nothing and lost nothing we were only getting money which we were not earning his voice as he talked sounded through the shop like the drone of a bee except that it was full of poison bits of white foam would soon gather in the corners of his thin mouth and i used to imagine that the blood in his veins boiled and bubbled as water boils and bubbles in a kettle over a fire he employed only the cheapest kind of labor and so he was in constant trouble in the warehouse he never sent a lot of coats without receiving some back to fix he always made me do the fixing as my time was the least valuable he would stand at the back of my chair and while showing me what to do he would pour out all his wrath on me on these nights when i rose to go home i could not straighten my back and though it was often bitter cold when i came out on the street i walked home slowly keeping near the wall one day instead of bringing the work home to be fixed the boss took me along to the warehouse and made me do it there when i told father about it in the evening he got the idea that i was a very valuable hand and told me to ask for a raise on friday all week i could not get the thought out of my mind that i must ask for a raise when friday came and it was time to go home i kept putting off talking to the boss until all the other workers were gone and i was alone 
at last i put on my coat and went and stood at his machine what do you want he snapped i could not get the words out of my mouth at once at last i said weakly i want a raise he dropped the work on his machine and sat staring at me the light of the gas jet over his machine fell full on his skeleton like face the expression of hatred in it frightened me but i stood still finally he said between his teeth say it again let me hear you say it again and i'll throw you down the four flights of stairs i went to the door and said i want my pay he bent his head over his work and said i haven't any now you will get it sunday morning when you come to work when i told it to father he said when you get your pay sunday you won't go there again sunday morning when i came to the shop i found all our men gathered on the street before the door the presser looked at me i am afraid little girl he said you are going to have a rest now the shop is closed and the boss is nowhere to be seen we have just sent a man to his home soon the man came back and said that the boss had not been seen in his boarding place since friday night the presser looked at each one of us one after the other how long does it take to go to canada twenty-four hours well then he is probably there now the baster collapsed on the doorstep he was a grey little old man he had been sick and this week's wages were the first he had earned in a long while i stood a while then i walked away from the shop where next i wondered chapter thirty two and now i came into mr cohen's shop i had to work here as hard as in any of the other places but of this shop i think with pleasure because here every one from mr cohen to the little boy in knee pants who came after school hours to pull basting was good and kind here too there was just a single set mr cohen himself was the baster all day he sat on his big table with his legs crossed and worked very hard to save the wages he would have had to pay a baster and do his own part of the work too the machine operator was his partner he was a small shy young man with a very pink face small black moustache and eyes when he was angry no one ever paid any attention to him because he wasn't really angry he could not be his name was fine and gussie the feller hand used to say that he was as fine as his name one day mr cohen was showing me how to make the little bars in the corners of the coat pockets finding that i learned it very quickly he conceived the idea of teaching me other parts of the trade so that i could help out all the big people and so i helped gussie who sat right opposite me at the narrow bench-like table with the felling and she taught me how to cross stitch labels i helped the finisher who sat next to me this was the part of the work that father had taught me and mr cohen taught me how to sew on buttons which was considered an art in itself for a properly sewed-on button on a coat has to stand up high and stiff and straight as though on a leg mr cohen showed frankly that i was a valuable hand and that he was pleased with me and paid me three and a half dollars instead of three which i had been getting and so now again i lifted my head a little my work was more interesting because it had variety i liked variety and i liked the people all except the presser he was the only one in the shop that used vulgar and obscene language in this shop when the time to go home came it used to please me to stay a few minutes longer it was always mr cohen's partner who reminded me that it was time to go home he nearly always said the same thing ruth you look so busy aren't you going home tonight i liked to hear him say it i liked to feel that someone was concerned about me i used to sit and wait for it sunday morning no one worked very steadily the men used to talk over the amusements of the day before i used to hear them talk about shakespeare's plays the jewish theatre jacob adler in the jewish king lear i listened to them and wondered who is shakespeare what are plays who is jacob adler who makes such a wonderful king lear about this time my own saturdays became less dull than they had been aunt masha left her place as nurse girl in reality she had been a general housemaid she had had to cook scrub and wash she had had to eat in a windowless little kitchen at the wash-tub and sleep on the floor she said she was utterly tired of this kind of life and wanted to try the shop father soon found her one where the boss was willing to teach her how to file coats on condition that she would work for three dollars a week for some time after 
and so she moved into a tiny bedroom with two other girls and i saw her more often on a saturday morning now she would come supervise the washing of my hair and tell me quite often that i was as stubborn as ever and in the afternoon she would take me along with her to visit her friends usually the young men and women gathered in someone's home and spent the whole afternoon singing and dancing russian dances none of them paid any attention to me or thought of asking me to join them i used to sit down in an out-of-the-way corner and watch them when i learned the dance songs i used to sing for them and soon they began to depend upon me as i sang i watched them and longed to dance too among the young men there was one who was distantly related to us he had been ten years in this country and he spoke english well i thought he was nicer and more polite than any of the others often i sat imagining that i too was dancing i was the tall dark-haired girl with whom this young man usually danced sometimes i wondered what i would do if he really came and asked me one day it occurred to me that perhaps if i wished very hard he would come and so i sat singing and wishing and watching one day when i saw him stop before me and ask me to dance i was not at all surprised it seemed quite natural hadn't i wished so hard i never knew how i went through that dance when he led me back to my chair and i was seated he bowed with a slightly exaggerated politeness as one sometimes does to a child and said in english pronouncing each word slowly and distinctly so that i should understand you dance like a little fairy when aunt masha and i were alone i asked her what is a fairy she did not know i asked many of our acquaintances but no one knew what a fairy was End of chapter thirty two chapters thirty three and thirty four of out of the shadow by rose gollop cohen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty three so a year almost passed and spring came at home in our village with the first warm days the birds would return to our neighbourhood and we could hear the click click of the storks that came back to build in the old stump in the cemetery in the air there was an agreeable smell of the moist earth warming in the sun the earth seemed to swell and burst right under our feet so that we could almost feel the plant life pushing its way to the light long before we could see it here with the first warm days i saw the children on the street appearing in lighter clothing with bright new tops and jumping ropes they seemed more free their laughter rang merrily and they responded more reluctantly to their mother's calls to come upstairs i too longed to stay out many mornings as i hurried to work through the soft air and early sunshine a sick feeling would come over me at the thought of the shop the dust-covered nailed-up windows the weight of the black heavy coats on my lap in the winter i had been glad enough when the coats were big and heavy they kept me warmer but now the coat on my lap seemed to weigh a ton and kept slipping and slipping from my lap all day long as if it would drag me down i could not make out what was wrong i felt depressed and tired even when i got up in the morning often too i felt a little sick though nothing hurt one day while standing at mr cohen's table i bent down to pick up something when i straightened again i felt the blood in my temples beat as though with hammers and everything on the table seemed topsy-turvy i had to stand still with my eyes closed for some minutes before i could see things in their right position and places the next morning when mrs cohen brought her husband's coffee as she did every morning she sat down next to me at our little table to pull some bastings which she always did when she came and began to talk to me she asked me some questions about my family and myself i told her i thought we would soon send for mother and the children and admitted that i had not been well for some time when i climbed steps my heart beat so that it pained and i could not stoop down without growing dizzy mrs cohen was a middle-aged kind woman and so pious that not a hair of her own would be seen from under her light brown wig she glanced at me now you do look pale she said and then advised me to go and see her doctor i was scared i had never been treated by a doctor in my life at home the old women of the village knew a charm prayer for every ailment and grandmother would brew tea out of different blossoms which we gathered in the spring in the evening i told father for the first time that i had not been feeling well and that mrs cohen offered to take me to her doctor father took a good look at me for the first time in a long while and showed alarm he told me by all means to go with mrs cohen and gave me a half dollar for the doctor 
a little before three o'clock the next day mrs cohen and i were in the doctor's office he was a big blond clean-shaven gentile man he looked into my eyes and made me shake my hands downward to see if they would grow pink i shook and shook my hands but they stayed almost white the doctor smiled cheerfully we'll soon fix you up he said stay out in the air and mrs cohen explained that i worked in the shop and that my mother was not here oh he said looking displeased he drew up and stuck out his lips put his elbow on the desk rested his chin in one hand and sat staring out of the window and drumming he sat so long that i thought he had forgotten all about us finally he caught up his pen and quickly as if to make up for lost time wrote a prescription here he said handing it to me it will help some i held out the half dollar he looked at it on my palm for a moment then took my hand in his great big one and put it down playfully and said that is all right but feed up this was the first time i heard these two little words but from now on i was to hear them often and for many years i stayed out the rest of that afternoon it seemed strange to be idle on a weekday i sauntered along through grand street toward the ferry looking into the store windows that night i sat up for father he laid the large brown loaf on the table when he came and sat down on the chair alongside it i saw at once that he had something pleasant to tell he was not smiling but his face looked all lit up after hearing what the doctor had to say and cautioning me to take the medicine regularly he began slowly drawing out his words almost as grandmother had often done and smiling now quite broadly you know raoul i think with this week's wages we have enough money for the steamer tickets the journey and a little over he put his hand deep into his pocket took out the long baggy purse and laid it on the table then he drew the white muslin curtain over the lower part of the window and told me to lift the lamp from the bracket to the table he began to count and i breathlessly watched his fingers as they turned back the bills ten fifteen twenty thirty and so on he counted finally he said slowly yes we have enough i could not realize that it was true that we could send for them at once then the thought came in three months they might be here i laid my arms on the table buried my face in them and began to sob father laid his hand gently on my head for once he did not scold me for my tears chapter thirty four a little over two months later father and i stood in line before one of the windows in the main post office on grand street waiting for mail during these two and a half months we had sent the tickets and heard that they had been received and that mother was selling out everything but the pillows the linens and the candlesticks then a letter had come saying that they had started that night aunt masha cried bitterly for then we knew that grandmother and grandfather were alone separated even from each other in their old age for where she went to stay they would not keep him and where he stayed they would not keep her now we were waiting to hear whether mother and the children had crossed the boundary safely or had been caught and turned back as father had been the first time he started for america we should have had a letter two days before father was very pale as he stood waiting his turn at last he was at the window and the clerk handed him a postcard it was in sister's handwriting she and i did all the corresponding neither father nor mother could write read quickly father said giving me the card and bending over me his voice trembled i spelled out the words we crossed the boundary safely and we are all well thank god thank god father repeated after me then he threw his head back and laughed joyously they will soon be here one week later early on saturday father aunt masha and i went looking for rooms all day we walked about climbing many stairs for of most rooms the rent was too high at last we found a small three-family rear house on broom street where the two rooms on the middle floor were empty we reached the rear house by passing through the long hall of the front tenement into a yard and then climbing a high stoop both rooms had windows facing the yard and the rear windows of the front tenement the water was in the yard and had to be pumped but father saw many advantages and i saw how i could turn the tiny hall where the upper tenant had to pass into a kitchen so we rented them for seven dollars a month one morning a few days later i was not well and father told me to stay home there were often days now when i was not well 
i thought this a golden opportunity to clean the new rooms so i started quite early from cherry street for the house on broom street i borrowed a pail and a scrubbing brush from our neighbour in the basement and went to work on the floors they were unpainted and thick with dirt i scrubbed and rinsed changing the water often by carrying the pailfuls of dirty water into the yard and pumping up fresh water at first it seemed impossible that i could get them clean but soon the grain of the wood began to show when i was on the last little piece near the door i sat back on my heels and surveyed the clean wet boards with a feeling of pleasure the clothes on my back felt damp and drops of perspiration were rolling from my cheeks down my neck i looked at my hands the palms and fingers were water-soaked and all crinkled up i remembered mother saying that i had the hands of a lazy girl and that i touched soiled things with my fingertips oh i thought if she could only see them now and with a feeling of satisfaction i dipped my hands into the pail of black muddy water up to the elbows and sang a song made up on the spot oh how i'll scrub how white our floors will be in the evening we parted from mrs felsberg not without tears and moved into our new rooms then the furniture came i spread newspapers over the floors tucked up my dress into the belt and ran about showing the men where to put each piece the large square table went into the centre of the big room and the six chairs all around it the two folding cots were put at the further end in the same room the big bed into the bedroom and i placed our old kerosene oil stove on a new soap-box in the little square hall taking care to leave at least a foot of space for our neighbours upstairs to pass i looked on this little corner as the kitchen and the large room as the front room i longed for a front room when the men were gone father and i looked about our rooms and at each other and we smiled happily as the days passed and the time drew near for their coming i became more and more impatient and nervous and found it more difficult than ever to sit in one place in the shop and think about the work however i did not always think about it often as i sat sewing on buttons or felling a sleeve lining i pictured them on the steamer and went over their whole journey in my mind sure that it was very much as my own had been first i saw them jogging along in Macar's straw-lined wagon from our village to mink then travelling by railroad and finally packed into a wagon of mouldy hay and driven through swampy meadows in the dead of night stealing across the boundary though a year had passed i could still feel the russian soldier's heavy hand on my back and hear his thick voice demanding what have you here the answer a jingle of silver coins and the thick voice call drive on i picture them sleeping in the bare dirty little cots in hamburg i saw mother with the four children standing in the large hall all day for a week and waiting for their names to be called then i saw them in the midst of a hundred others bent over to one side or stooping under their bundles passing through a sort of tunnel meekly and looking neither to right nor to left they followed a uniformed person tramp 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 i heard the dull sound of many feet and two onlookers calling to each other the immigrants and the echo calling back the immigrants but now i thought joyfully they are on the steamer very near america how will mother like america will she be much shocked at father's and my impiety for i was not so pious now i still performed some of the little religious rites assigned to a girl but mechanically not with the ever-present consciousness of god there were moments of deep devotion but they were rare sometimes when i thought of it i felt sad i felt as if i had lost something precious the steamer was due on a friday night so they would have to spend still another night on it that friday both father and i came home earlier than usual while he was washing up and polishing his shoes and brushing his clothes i cooked a fish dinner for seven people for the next day and at the kind invitation of our neighbour over us put it on her ice into the crowded little ice-box then i remembered that mother had no candles to light on the steamer i would light them here she usually lit five one for each child so i found a red brick on the street washed it clean under the pump and used it as a candle holder we had not bought any candlesticks as we expected our beautiful brass ones from home i placed the clean brick on the table in the front room covered now with a new white oilcloth then with a drop of the hot tallow from each candle i stuck them firmly on the brick in a straight row i placed two white loaves at the other end of the table and covered them with a clean small towel i lit the candles and embracing them three times i covered my face with my hands and whispered the consecration prayer for my mother on the steamer then as i looked around the room 
i felt for the first time in this country the joyous friday night spirit of the old home in the new one i sat out in the yard until father would be ready for supper i watched the stars appearing one by one from the open windows father's cheerful voice came chanting the friday evening prayer in the basement a rocker creaked and a little boy sang sweet and low sweet and low the next morning at ten o'clock father and i again stood in castle garden i do not know whether aunt masha was with us or not as i look back now i can only see father and myself he talking to an officer and i standing with my face pressed against iron bars in what an agony of joy and fear i stood there at first i was neither surprised nor disappointed when i looked about and did not see them at once feeling sure that they must be there i could wait then it flashed through my mind but perhaps they are not here perhaps they missed the steamer perhaps they fell ill then i saw them it was as i often pictured them mother with baby on one arm a bundle on the other and the eight-year-old boy at her skirt was following a uniformed american she walked slowly with her head a little bent and her eyes on the ground her face looked so uncertain as if she were not yet sure whether her journey was at an end and whether this was the place where she would meet us after her came sister quite bent under a bundle on her back and with the little four-year-old holding on to her skirt though she was so bent under her bundle her head was raised and her eyes were looking about eagerly then they met mine and as she recognized me she dropped her bundle and ran screaming mamma there they are there they are a few minutes later i heard my mother's tearful joyous voice close to me rel rel end of part two chapter thirty four part three chapters thirty five and thirty six from out of the shadow by rose gollop cohen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty five for days father kept asking mother to tell him all about herself home our friends our relatives he never seemed to grow tired of hearing it and she repeated the same thing over and over again and i walked to and fro from the shop spent the day there and what was left of the evening at home as though i were in a happy dream often during these first days i feared that mother's being here was only a dream often at such moments i watched her sitting at the window sewing making a little shirt perhaps out of a bit of muslin i would go over to her lean up against her a little shamefacedly and ask her mamma are you really here in america she understood she would laugh a little press a corner of the little shirt to her eyes and say yes i am here one day she said sadly yes all life is like a dream to-day we are here to-morrow god knows then she added as though she were following a thought in her own mind ah if i had my youth to live over again and if i had only known that i would have to be in america what then mother then she said as tears rolled down her cheeks and fell on the stitches i would have learned how to write even if i'd had to go without bread sometimes ah if at least i could write to my mother so even during these happy days there were tears mother like aunt masha and myself and others that i have known felt bewildered and uncertain about herself and everything she did and said during these first days it was pathetic to see how she looked up to me because i had already been here a year and probably showed off a little she treated me like a grown-up girl and allowed herself in her lovely quiet way to be guided by me in many little things the children were a constant care and delight especially the two little ones it was amusing to see how they were impressed by the different things the little girl four years old thought it quite wonderful to have water right in the yard and running so easily so as many times a day as she could steal away she would be found at the pump with her shoes and stockings off pumping water over her two little bare feet and rubbing them industriously once on hearing the baby now two years old screaming in the yard we ran out and found him lying flat on his little stomach with his fair curly head under the pump while the four-year-old stood at the handle one little hand pumping with great difficulty and the other rubbing his head often in their play they imitated what they had seen on their journey being lately from the steamer they played crossing the ocean she was the great ocean steamer she would stand in the middle of the yard her feet wide apart her hands on her little hips rocking herself slowly from side to side 
and roaring with great earnestness in imitation of the waves meanwhile the baby would drag the dishpan and a wooden spoon from the closet and strut around and around the yard banging on the pan and crying mittag mittag in german announcing the meals on the steamer sister surprised me with her fearlessness in going about everywhere and her quickness in adopting american ways she found her way quite easily she would wash and dress the children curl their hair on her finger american fashion and take them out into the street she would take them along wherever she went she never stole away from them as i had often done from her she and i shared one of the cots in the front room we used to lie with our arms about each other whispering until way into the night the boy eight years old was serious and sensitive and would not stand for any trifling he liked to stand out on the street before the door and observe life in america as no money could be spared for new clothes the children had to wear out what they had his shoes made by our village shoemaker were in excellent condition in spite of the rough treatment of fumigation and the wear and tear of the journey but shoes more than any other article of clothing showed the greenhorn and so often he was so tormented by the children in the street that he would come into the house in tears he begged and cried and demanded american shoes but it was no use so he tried to see what he could do by knocking and rubbing them on stones but these shoes of the homely strong russian leather could stand it without showing more than a few scratches one day when he went out into the street he did not return until dark and then he was in his bare feet on being asked what he had done with his shoes he said with tears and an expression which said that he was prepared for the worst that he had thrown them away where he did not know himself fearing that under a threat of punishment he might be weak enough to go and look for them he threw them so that he himself should not be able to find them he flung them he said from a strange roof one in one direction one in the other he told his story and stood before father with his eyes on the ground ready to take the punishment which he knew would follow that evening when father went out into the street he brought back a black strap of fringed leather with a wooden handle and hung it up in the big room on the door of father and myself i was the more americanized under pressure i could converse in english a little while he could not talk it at all so he left translating the children's names to me i was delighted i longed to call them by names that were not only american but also unusual so as i sat in the shop i spent many hours thinking and sounding each name in my mind over and over again but when i finally decided on all the names i felt uneasy at the thought that there was no resemblance between the hebrew and the english names so i just translated them into english after all sister whose name was leah we called leah the little four-year-old girl changed from Miriam to miriam the baby was azra but at least one i could not resist calling by an uncommon name i called the boy morgan though his name translated was ezekiel i knew i had a leaning towards things which i heard people call queer i felt ashamed and hid it whenever i was aware of it i felt ashamed of my desire to call my brother morgan but neither could i bear to give it up so i called him by that name only when no one was by who was likely to ridicule me mother had been here only a short time when i noticed that she looked older and more old-fashioned than father i noticed that it was so with most of our women especially those that wore wigs or kerchiefs on their heads so i thought that if i could persuade her to leave off her kerchief she would look younger and more up-to-date but remembering my own first shock i decided to go slowly and be careful not to hurt her feelings so one day when i happened to be at home and the children were playing in the yard and we two were alone in the house i asked her playfully to take off her kerchief and let me do her hair just to see how it would look she consented reluctantly she had never before in her married life had her hair uncovered before any one i took off her kerchief and began to fuss with her hair it was dark and not abundant but it was soft and had a pretty wave in it when i parted it in front and gathered it up in a small knot in the middle of the back of her head leaving it soft over the temples i was surprised at how different she looked i had never before known what a fine broad forehead my mother had nor how soft with her blue-gray eyes set rather deep and far apart i handed her our little mirror from cherry street she glanced at herself admitted frankly that it looked well and began hastily to put on her kerchief as if she feared being frivolous too long i caught hold of her hands mamma i coaxed please don't put the kerchief on again ever at first she would not even listen to me 
but i sat down in her lap and i began to coax and beg and reason i drew from my year of experience and observation and pointed out that wives so often looked so much older because they were more old-fashioned that the husbands were often ashamed to go out with them i told her that it was so with mrs felsberg and mrs cohen and this nice woman upstairs i said if she would only take off her wig and mother put her finger on my lips but father trims his beard i still argued her face looked sad is that why she said i too must sin but i finally succeeded when father came home in the evening and caught sight of her while still at the door he stopped and looked at her with astonishment what he cried half earnestly half jestingly already you are becoming an american lady mother looked abashed for a moment and in the next to my surprise and delight i heard her brazen it out in her quiet way as you see she said i am not staying far behind chapter thirty six it was slack in our shop every week mr cohen made me stay home a day or two it was slack all over the city at all trades writers and lecturers now refer to that time as the memorable years eighteen ninety three to ninety four years of extreme economic depression we felt this depression when one day father came home from the shop at three o'clock in the afternoon not to alarm mother who had been here only two months he made light of the rumour that people were out of work all over the city but when a few weeks passed and he began to stay home three and four days a week he looked openly alarmed and began to talk of moving back to cherry street and when two brothers and a sister who were from our part of the country came one night and asked to be taken in as lodgers we finally decided to do it so with our lodgers we moved into a room and two bedrooms on cherry street again this time between jefferson and clinton streets the rooms were on the stoop in the rear the toilets for the whole building were in the yard facing our windows the water pump in the street hall the rent was ten dollars a month we gave the two brothers the little hall bedroom with the window for the sister a cot was put up for the night in the large room with us children they paid five dollars a month so now we felt easier as our rent was only five dollars a month but our easy days were not many one night soon after we had settled in our new home mr cohen called me over to his table just as i was leaving and told me that he had no work for me for the next day this would make three days out for that week mr cohen saw that i was troubled and began to explain you see gussie is a woman and needs the money while you i felt irritated i felt that because i was a child i was paid little and even then they did not seem to think that i needed the money as though i didn't have to live and help support my people i burst out i too need it my people have just come and i felt miserable gussie and i were good friends oh very well mr cohen said quickly take turns then a week passed perhaps when again just as we were going home mr cohen told gussie that he was sorry but there was so little work that there was no use of her staying on i dared not look at her face as he talked to her when he came out into the street she walked away from me without saying good night one by one i watched the men in our shop laid off finally there was just mr cohen and his partner left then my turn came a short time after i began to stay home father's shop was closed altogether every day now all over the city shops were being closed nevertheless father went out every morning always looking bright and hopeful of finding at least a few hours work he would return at noon looking not quite so bright he was not discouraged but as week after week passed his face grew thinner and the smile that had always lit up his whole face became rare but still he spoke cheerfully this can't last much longer he would say there must be an end to it it is almost two months now all this weighed more heavily on mother her face was paler her features stood out sharply and her eyes seemed to have gone deeper into her head she was always serious and now she looked as if a dreadful calamity were hanging over us among strangers in a strange country she began counting the potatoes she put into the pot and would ask the children over and over again when they wanted more bread are you sure you want it two months passed and a great change seemed to have come over the people the closed shops turned the workers out into the streets and they walked about idly looking haggard and shabby often as i sauntered along through cherry or monroe street i would meet someone with whom i had worked we avoided each other we felt ashamed of being so idle 
we felt ashamed of our shabby clothes we avoided each other's eyes to save each other pain and humiliation the greeting of those who could not possibly avoid one another was something like this what a holiday in your shop too nor would they remain talking long both would stand looking away gloomily for a few minutes and finally with a short nod they would walk apart dejectedly every day i saw on sherry and monroe streets grocers closing up and women at the pushcarts haggling more and more desperately over a cent how much are these bananas five for a cent they are not bigger than my finger and the skin is all black oh very well take six take six for god's sake and go i haven't made a cent to-day one day as i was walking on grand street toward the bowery i saw a tall slim man coatless and bareheaded with a rag bag over his shoulder bent over a garbage can there was something familiar to me about him i was on the opposite side of the street and stood looking at him and soon i remembered he was or he had been a machine operator he and his wife had been a merry couple and they had a sweet baby whom they adored they had lived in our old three thirty eight cherry street over the felsbergs i had often been in their home and watched them singing and dancing with their baby now i hardly recognized him a ragged grey shirt covered his back his long thin body was bent his face looked black and hollow but what struck me with horror was that he seemed entirely unaware that he was among human beings he acted as though he felt himself in a lone desert feverishly he stood stirring the can with a stick his eyes looked into it eagerly and his lips were moving as i recognized him i ran toward him a few steps then the full meaning of it all struck me i threw my arms over my head and ran from him in terror one day while mother and we children stood out on the stoop a woman we knew came over to us she lived by doing all sorts of odd things particularly by matchmaking and recommending girls to places of domestic service and as she walked about the street attending to her business she knit a stocking she was a stout elderly woman and wore a kerchief tied under her chin and tucked away behind her ears she barely glanced at me and as her eyes returned to her quickly moving needles missus she said i have a place for your girl with a very nice family mother's lips drew together tightly without looking at mother the woman kept on talking in a slow persuasive tone there are only six in the family they live on clinton street near grand i think they would pay her six dollars a month will you let her go my mother's face went white no she shook her head she climbed up the stoop steps and went into the house i followed her and asked why don't you let me go mother out of the six dollars we could pay our share of the rent for a whole month and have a dollar over she turned away from me leaned against the wall and cried is this what i have come to america for that my children should become servants it was three months now since father and i had earned anything we owed the landlord five dollars for this third month we gave him just what the lodgers had paid us what there was left of our own money we kept just for bread and a little milk for the two smaller children father used to bring the big round loaf of bread from the bread stand on hester street when he came home at night we were always in bed then and the light in the lamp was turned low but i was often awake mother would sit up and wait for him and open the door and he would come in on tiptoe lay the bread on the table and sit down heavily beside it then mother would cut some of the bread sweeten some hot water in a glass and give it to him then she would sit down on another chair near the table and sit staring on the floor in front of her while he ate his supper he used to chew every mouthful a long time and drink the hot water slowly sometimes in the stillness i could hear a deep half-stifled sigh they seldom spoke once i heard father ask how are the children how should they be she answered hanging on to life she covered her face and sobbed in the morning father was gone on his daily hunt for work before we were up he no longer came home at noon now for when he was away he did not have to eat the two older children leah and ezekiel were going to school and the two little ones were kept in bed as long as we could that they might be warm for it was winter now we had not much covering mother had not brought her five pillows linens and candlesticks after all she had sold everything in hamburg for a few dollars hearing a rumour that she would be allowed no luggage except what she could carry then she heard that the rumour had been raised that the immigrants might sell out 
when the children came from school they would go out on the street and do the docks and pick up bits of coal paper and wood and then we would make a fire we used to put on water to boil and draw our chairs close to the stove to draw all the warmth we could out of it when our lodgers came home they often complained of the bitter cold in the house but they were not very well off themselves they made knee pants and seldom had more than two days work a week the small school which the children attended was i think connected with a church or a missionary society one day when the children came home they told us that any child in the class who would say a prayer received a slice of bread and honey mother looked at them and asked them to tell her about it sister said there is nothing to tell if you just bow your head as you sit at the desk and repeat the prayer after the teacher you receive a slice of white bread and honey we heard a great deal about the missionaries that winter on grand street at the corner of attorney street there was a big store with green shades which were always drawn in this store we knew the missionaries held a meeting every saturday we heard that the head of the missionaries was a baptized jew i heard my parents express their anger because they came and settled right in the heart of the jewish neighborhood we children used to run past the store with a feeling of fear and then stand at a little distance and look at it i often went back to look inside through a worn part of the shade and saw a man standing up and talking and a few people in the back of the room listening week after week the man preached almost to an empty room still we hated to have them in the neighborhood to tempt our people one saturday afternoon father came home and said that he had just passed the missionary store on grand street they are doing good business these days he said as i passed the door opened and i saw the place crowded with people we heard that any one who went there and listened to the lectures received food and clothing a young man who was a friend of our lodgers used to come to visit them when he became well acquainted with us he would come in at any time during the day even when his friends were out of course he was out of work it was six months now since he had earned anything he looked like the rest of us shabby despondent half starved if he happened to come in when we were having a meal mother always invited him to eat with us he would take the bread which like father he chewed slowly and often said this is very good bread he would sit and argue with mother trying to convince her that it was no sin to accept food from missionaries when one was almost starving but do they give it to you you have to show that you believe with them that you accept their religion even so he said the sin would be theirs for making such demands from starving people after he was gone mother said that is all talk he is not religious but after all he is a jew oh god she would say with a touch of pride one only has to look into his sunken eyes to see starvation and yet he does not go to them another month passed and all our money was gone for a week or so we borrowed from our lodgers ten and fifteen cents at a time until we had a dollar then we did not know what to do we would not ask the coal man and the grocer to trust us we had never owed any one and father and mother shrank from the very thought of owing besides the coal man and the grocer hardly knew us we had not bought much coal and bread was a cent cheaper at the big stand on hester street on the morning when father took the last few cents he went away earlier than usual and mother walked about with slow shuffling steps from room to room as the children were leaving for school she asked them without looking at them whether bread and honey was still given to the children at school yes sister said to those who bow their heads and pray the boy was already out of the room when mother called after them you can bow your heads and pray then she went into her dark bedroom End of chapter thirty six